I am excited to give this talk. It's something I care a lot about in terms of trying to help uh, investigators, especially young investigators, uh, learn how to write articles in an effective way um, for submission to a major uh, biomedical journal. Um, I have nothing to disclose um, other than the fact that blood does actually pay me to be editor-in-chief, so I guess that's a financial conflict of interest slightly. So I think the objectives are clear. I would like to have you understand the biomedical publication processes and avoid common pitfalls that we sometimes um, encounter when you're writing articles up for publication. Okay, so there are, there are a number of major steps we're going to talk about. The really important one is planning and executing your experiments or your clinical protocol or clinical trial. And I'm not going to um, um, pretend that I can tell you how to do all of your science or your clinical, uh, clinical investigation correctly. But I'll talk about some of the aspects of setting up your experiments um, so that you don't end up three years later unable to publish your data in an effective way. I'm going to talk about choosing a target journal. Hopefully it'll always be blood, but sometimes there can be other options. Um, I want you to know how to prepare the paper for submission to a journal, the actual submission process itself, and what to do after you hear the first decision from the journal, other than jump off a cliff or have a big party. So this is the goal. This is the uh, initial publication in a journal that's not blood, unfortunately, um, f of the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick. The striking nature of this is how concise it is, how well written it is. Um, how humble it is. They don't, he, they don't use words about how phenomenal and groundbreaking and incredibly exciting their own work is. They knew how exciting it was. People had been trying to figure out the structure of DNA for a long time, and it was a beautiful moment when they figured out that this structure actually explained almost everything you needed to know about uh, DNA replication and thus life itself. Um, and it was also obviously very important. So we wish to suggest a structure for the salt of deoxyribonucleic acid. That's very humble, very succinct, very concise, but tells you what you need to know. So when you're doing your experiments or setting up your clinical trials, I think it is important to plan ahead. Perform experiments during the actual experimental process that test alternative explanations of your hypotheses, especially if your work seems to be going down a line that is going to challenge paradigms in your field. You need to plan your controls carefully because it would really be a shame in a mouse experiment of transplanting hematopoietic stem cells to have to go back and transplant a whole, number, a whole other cohort of concurrent controls and wait another year to study long-term hematopoiesis. At that point, you're probably already gone from your lab and you're never going to get that paper written. And assess the novelty before you begin the process of setting up your experiments. It's really depressing when you start to write the paper and you figure out that somebody did exactly the same thing 20 years before, but you hadn't bothered to read the literature when you started your experiments. You didn't read the literature until you were trying to write the discussion in your paper. And then it gets a little dicey to try to figure out how you're going to you know, make it clear that your experiment showed something different that we didn't already know. It's important to get appropriate statistical input in advance. Now, for most clinical studies, um, that's pretty automatic. Luckily, IRBs and DSMBs and the drug company you may be working with, they automatically get statistical input because that's considered a very important aspect of protecting patients to not do either too many or too few patients in a clinical trial. But for animal studies and laboratory studies, it's much less frequent for you to have automatic statistical input, but you need to seek it out and make sure that you're doing experiments that are going to be interpretable in a meaningful way at the end. So think about what magnitude of differences would be important or biologically meaningful. And then once you know what the magnitude of difference is and what the measurement error may be, you can come up with a, a, a study size that's going to be appropriate. Think about what your null hypothesis is and then go forward with your experiments. Don't just keep doing experiments until you show statistical significance. That's not an appropriate way. If you're doing clinical studies, obviously this, you need to obtain um, institutional review, review board approval. Um, if you um, can get an exemption, a, a waiver, for instance, instance, doing retrospective chart reviews or looking um, at data in large epidemiologic databases, that's fine, but you do have to get some kind of approval from a, an ethical body. Depending on country you're in, it may be different processes for different countries, but you need to do something and include that in your paper saying that you have gotten ethical uh, approval for the studies. You need to register the study at clintrials.gov or some other um, ICMJE approved clinical trials registry before you start your enrollment in the clinical trial. Um, because if you don't do that, um, you're not going to be able to publish the work in, in really any reputable biomedical journal at this point. Um, it's any study that started enrolling patients in phase two to phase four studies after July 1st, 2005. 
It's not required for phase one studies in most circumstances, but many people do register phase one trials as well. If you don't do that, you're, you're completely up a creek because most journals actually check um, when you submit your paper, they go and look in the registry and see if it's listed there and, you know, see what the date of enrollment was. It's also useful to keep track of the dates that you begin enrolling and that you do your data analysis and include that in the paper um, because it, it's, right, it's really quite confusing for people later on doing meta-analyses and other reuses of your data that will be very helpful because they will cite your paper if they use your data. And if they don't know when you started enrolling patients, it can be very difficult for them to in, um, interpret the data appropriately. And also, it can be very difficult for reviewers to interpret data that you were doing um, hydroxyurea for CML, and they're saying, well, why weren't you using Gleevec? Well, it turns out because you started the study before Gleevec was approved. I mean, that's the kind of thing that the dates can be very useful for. So when you're actually planning laboratory studies or any studies that involve showing, you know, primary data in the paper like gels, you know, think about the final figure in the paper every time you set up an experiment, every time you set up a gel. So include all the controls on the gels that you're going to put in the figures in the right order. You know, don't have things going backwards and all over the place and have random patient samples from some other experiment that's stuck on the gel because you thought that would save time and money. If you're going to do that, put them way on the other end and put a, you know, blank lane in between. You know, put them in a logical order. If it's a time course, put them in the time course order. Because when you're trying to put it together in your final figure and you have, you have to start splicing lanes out and putting them in different orders, it just looks really sloppy. And if things look sloppy, people think that everything you've done is sloppy. Um, and we'll talk more about image manipulation um, towards the end. Do save all your data in a high resolution, original format. Don't just cut and paste your data into PowerPoint and then delete your original files from you know, the phospho imager or whatever you're using to collect data because it really is a nightmare. First of all, most journals need high resolution figures and PowerPoint is not high resolution. If there's any question later on about the veracity of your data, um, it's a nightmare and you probably can't justify in any way that you really did what you said you did if there's any question if all you have is a PowerPoint file that doesn't have an original date stamp when the data was collected.